Now, I'm very pleased today to welcome Helen Sanderford and Jeanne McCartan as our webinar presenters. Helen and Jeanne are co-authors of Viewpoint 1 and 2 with Mike McCarthy and also with Mike of Touchstone. They both have considerable experience of teaching in a variety of situations around the world. Over to you, um, Jeanne. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. I hope that you can hear me. Let me explain what we're going to do today. The session is billed as a question and answer webinar, but we thought that to get us started and to add some structure to it, we would start off with four questions ourselves. And these are questions which came out of some research that Cambridge University Press did with teachers earlier this year about the challenges of teaching higher level learners. So I'll tell you what those four questions are now so that you can see if your questions are one of them or you can save up your questions for later. I'm going to speak for a little while, then I'm going to hand over to Helen and then we will open it up to a more general discussion and question and answer session. So let's start with our questions. The first one is, how can I help my students to use more than a basic vocabulary? The idea being that students tend to stick with a safe and known vocabulary. Secondly, how can I get my students to stop making the same fossilized errors? The idea here is that the errors students make are so old that they've become almost like fossils embedded in their English. The third one, how do I ensure students understand the difference between written and spoken English and know when to use which of those and not to confuse them? And finally, how can I improve <clears throat> my own language skills, which was a concern with many teachers? So let's start with the first question. How can I help my students to use more than a basic vocabulary? And I think this is something that we all know from teaching higher level learners. After learners have studied the first, say, 2,000 most frequent words, then they begin to feel lost because the vocabulary then becomes a vast ocean of infrequent words which they see very rarely and the sense of progression seems to get lost. The fact that these words don't crop up so often means that they're not seeing them recycled so often. And this is a problem because in fact after the first 2,000 most frequent words in the language, all the rest of the words are in fact pretty infrequent. So it's a huge task to try and learn them. But learn them, students have to, especially if they're going on to use English in, the, in their future career or in education. And we can see how important this is in some of the research that has been going on at the University of Cambridge with Cambridge University Press, Cambridge English Language Assessment and the University, where they've been looking at the different levels of English in the examinations and profiling what learners can do at each level. And as part of that research, they've also been looking at how examiners grade or mark what students do. And one of the research projects was on the IELTS speaking test. And the researchers looked at transcripts of students who scored very high scores and compared those with transcripts of students who got low scores. And they compared them across various criteria, one of which was the, the choice and use of vocabulary. And what they found was that candidates who got a high score, like a nine, may develop a topic using lexical items which are less common 
and which portray them as having a higher level of education and social status. So one of the examples they used was the word attire, A-T-T-I-R-E, meaning the way someone is dressed. And a student who used words like that was more likely to have a higher score in the test. And you can read about this research um, in the English Profile Journal, which is published by Cambridge University Press, and it is free online. So basically, the way students used a higher level of the vocabulary gave an impression of the student being more educated and professional. It projected an identity of being a confident high achiever. And of course, that's what all students want to do in many ways, whether they're taking an exam or not, if they're going into the world of work. That's how they would like themselves to be received and perceived. So the question is, how can we help students develop a, a repertoire of higher level vocabulary? How can we help them going to go on to that next level? Well, one of the approaches that, that we've taken in, in our materials and that we would advocate is to increase students' ability to express key basic concepts. So, for example, to help them go from constantly saying, this is a big problem when they're discussing something, to things like saying things like, this is a major issue, this is a significant issue, this is a major concern. So, to build on a basic idea like big and problem, and to build synonyms and ways of expressing the same thing in different words. Clearly, we need materials to help people do this. And this is an example of a learning tip on building synonyms, which recycles a lot of vocabulary which students have learned. And it it tells students that they should learn more than one way to express basic concepts like big, small, many, important, good, and bad, etc. And that this will be especially important in their formal writing. And the examples here are for bad, with two examples, one with inferior and one with poor. With recent advances in GPS, older versions now seem inferior you can be fired for poor performance at work. So this is the kind of vocabulary that sounds a little bit more academic, a little bit more professional, and gives an impression of the student as someone who is more fluent and, and more educated. Of course, all these tips need a health warning. Um, with word processing software these days, it's very easy to find synonyms using a word processing thesaurus. And it's a good way to, to find synonyms, but the warning is you need to check them in a dictionary before you use them so that you don't just pick a synonym which doesn't fit. Now, in addition to having concentrated, focused vocabulary sessions, you could, it's also a good idea to pop in a synonym building activity at any point in the lesson. So for example, after you've taught a lesson, maybe um, a conversation or a text, you can go back and look at it and select two or three words, or maybe have your students select two or three words that they look for synonyms for. So for example, this is a very short extract from a conversation in some material, um, and the students are discussing how you define happiness and success and whether they're the same thing. And one student says, as far as I can tell, they're not necessarily the same thing. I mean, according to a recent job satisfaction survey, accountants are the most unhappy. But as far as careers go, accounting is considered one of the best. So 
So you might want to focus on the word unhappy there and have students find other words that would go into that slot. A basic concept like happy, unhappy, options might be dissatisfied or discontented. But not, if you're looking in your word processing software, words like sorrowful. So again, do check in the dictionary that you find the right kind of synonym here. And you can have students practice the conversations, replacing the keywords that you've chosen with new uh, synonyms. And it might be fun to see how many times you can practice with how many different, different synonyms. Other approaches um, to this problem of vocabulary, one thing <coughs> I think that has come out of some research is that learning vocabulary isn't only about learning lots of new words, but it's about exploring and learning more about the words that you already know. So for example, you learn the word green as a color when you're at elementary level, and then as you go up the levels, you realize it's used in the context of the environment to mean environmentally friendly or green politics. And if you go up the levels again, you may learn that green has a, has a, a meaning of, that someone is inexperienced or even naive. And research by Chian in 2002 who was looking at uh, the TOEFL academic reading test. The research um, that was done by Chan showed that increasing the depth of knowledge of your vocabulary was just as important as increasing the vocabulary size in terms of predicting successful performance in academic reading. So learning more about the words you know is just as important as learning new words. Second point is to capitalize on students' own interests. Um, one interesting um, notion that's come up recently is that when students learn the vocabulary of one domain or one subject area, it can have a general effect on their performance overall. So that might be an area of uh, academic interest or professional interest like engineering or medicine, or it can be a leisure interest like gardening or a kind of pop music or, or, or sport. So encouraging students to, to read and present in English about their own interests is a very powerful way of helping them to improve their English vocabulary overall. When we're thinking about classroom activities, I think it's important to give students planning and rehearsal time in class, especially before activities where they're required to discuss a topic that's maybe quite a, a, an abstract topic or difficult or, or controversial. And encourage them to plan not only the things that they want to say, but also different ways of saying that and give them a little time to, to practice it. After all, it's what we all do when we have to speak in public. I'm not speaking to you entirely spontaneously now. I've thought about it. I've rehearsed it. I hope you can tell. Um, I've made notes about it. So rather than getting students always to be um, performing and, and producing language, give them a little reflection, planning, and rehearsal time. And this is a good way of um, helping students to activate that passive or receptive vocabulary um, that they have in the back of their minds but which might not be on the tip of their tongue when they're in full flow of an activity. And I also think, and I'm guilty of this too, that we want to be changing activities 
all the time, going on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. But I think occasionally, especially with speaking activities, which are perhaps more thoughtful or reflective, allow students opportunities to think about an activity they've done, what they've said, how they could have said it better if they've had a little more time, and then repeat that activity, but perhaps with a different group or a different partner, so that the activity as a discussion activity is still valid. They're, they're getting the views and ideas of different people, but they're having a second chance at saying what they want to say in in a better and or or not necessarily a better but maybe just a different way. Okay, I'd like to move on now to our next question, which is this perennial problem of students making the same fossilized errors. Um, I'm sad to tell you I don't have a magic wand and I don't have the easy on answer here because I recognize how difficult this is when students have been saying the same thing for many years of learning it's very very deep within them but perhaps um, we can offer a few reflections to help you approach this very, very difficult issue. Um, when you are looking at a problem, and this, um, the issue here is countability. Students make lots of mistakes with countable and uncountable nouns. They tend to make uncountable nouns plural, or they use them with an article. When you're dealing with a deeply embedded problem like this, it's a good idea to mix the old information with the new. So a chart like this deals with countable and uncountable nouns. And on the right-hand side, you see the uncountable nouns explanation. And there are some of the perennial problems like work, explain how your work can save money. So work and money are the the old words, if you like, that um, you expect students to know. And then you can feed in some new items like feedback and research, which our research on the learner corpus shows begin to be a problem at about the B2 level. Now, as part of that chart, there is a common errors panel. And it says, don't make these uncountable nouns plural or use them with uh, un or with plural verbs. Now, what follows there are about 10 uncountable nouns, which our research on the learner corpus has shown students make the most persistent errors with. Their information, equipment, advice, research, knowledge, software, work, homework, training, help evidence and permission. These are the ones that research tells us students persistently get wrong. So rather than try and tackle the whole of the countability problem, why not have students learn those 10 words, or if that's too much, just five of them, to remind them that these words are uncountable and that they will at least get five or ten words correct. And you can build activities around these words such as this where students have to put in a correct form of the noun, whether it's with an article or with a plural or without an article. And you see those, those words coming up like information and permission um, and training, these, these persistent words. And then have students ask and answer the questions to get double duty. Tackling persistent errors is, is a real, real problem. And I think it's important to be selective. So formal contexts are more of an issue. So be, more, be stricter in writing and formal speaking than in everyday 
conversation. And I would say pick your battles as well. Decide what are the top 10 errors you want to try and eradicate rather than do everything. And negotiate with the students which you want to tackle. Why not have a zero tolerance week or session? So this week we have zero tolerance for uncountable nouns being used wrongly. Next week we're going to have zero tolerance um, of another kind of error, like the third person. It's an S on present simple verbs. So that your, your, um, your attack on, on these errors is very focused. And attach a memorable phrase. I'm very fond of um, the little phrase we use, 30 days, half September, April, June and November, to help me remember how many days there are in each month. So try and find memorable phrases that will help students. So for example, one error students make is, is to use up with grow when they're talking about the economy growing. So children grow up but economies grow. And you can have students write their own version of that kind of uh, phrase, something that's memorable to them. My children are, um, are not yet grown up. Last year, the economy grew by 10% or whatever. So have each student personalize it for themselves. Or attach an activity that uses a correct form. Um, for example, students are often making mistakes with ditransitive verbs. They say things like, I bought a gift to my mother. Well, why not set up an activity um, where everyone in the class has to say something about what they bought or what they're going to buy for a member of their family? And you can add in a task element like, the idea is to find out what the most common gifts are and everyone in the class has to say what they bought for two or three members of their family. So drill it, have chain sentences, um, constant practice. It's a question of digging out those fossils and replacing them with a bright, shiny, correct new form. Now I'm going to stop talking now and I'm going to hand over to Helen. Okay, Helen, over to you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm talking to you from Park City in Utah. Um, it's a great pleasure to be with you. I'm going to continue with the presentation now um, with the third and fourth questions uh, that teachers were frequently asking us about teaching higher level students. And the third question was this, how do I ensure students understand the difference between written and spoken English? It's um, certainly a, a very interesting area of language. One of the things that becomes very apparent uh, when we study a corpus of language is that there are very real differences between spoken and written English. There are often expressions that we use in spoken language um, that are not used as frequently in written language, for example, or may indeed not be appropriate in writing. Um, yet these expressions or strategies, when they're used in spoken language, they sound very natural. And one could argue that using these kinds of spoken expressions and strategies uh, may contribute to fluency in English. Um, talking about fluency in English is, is beyond the scope of uh, today's presentation. But let's take a look at um, an example. Here's a conversation. Uh, Jill and Kyung are talking about the news. And Jill says, have you noticed how some people seem almost addicted to news? Like this guy at work, he has all these news apps on his phone, but he never knows what's going on, really. And Kyung says, yeah, my girlfriend, she watches news channels all the time, but I don't think she really listens. You know what I mean? It's just background noise. 
And what you'll notice here is that both Jill and Kyung mention the topic they're going to talk about. And then they use a pronoun and then they make their comment. So you'll see that Jill says, this guy at work. She's talking about the topic. And then she says, he has all these news apps on his phone. And Pyung, he says, my girlfriend. Again, he states the topic. And then he uses a pronoun and says she watches news channels all the time. This is a very common device um, in spoken language. And we use it to preface or highlight the topic that we want to talk about. And we often put the topic at the start of a sentence like this. However, although this is very common in spoken language, it's not something that appears in writing. And you'll see a note in our In Conversation panel here that says these structures are for use in conversation only. Do not use them in writing. So this is a very uh, a good illustration of, of a clear distinction between spoken and written language. Even within the realm of spoken language, we can make distinctions between language that we use informally and formally. This is especially important when we're teaching a higher level students. We need our students to be able to understand and recognize formality, um, especially if they're using English to give oral presentations, uh, in communications with professors or with employee, employers at interviews, for example. And here's an example of how we do this, how we recognize the difference between uh, informal and formal speaking. Um, here the students are focusing in on a topic um, at a seminar. This actual conversation is taking place in a more formal setting. A seminar is a more formal se setting where we might not expect students to be speaking quite as informally as they would in conversation with their friends. And there are several expressions here um, that we teach um, to show how students can focus in on a topic. And the expressions are these, as far as success is concerned, as far as careers go, when it comes to happiness or being happy, whatever the topic is there, and in terms of. And what's really useful for you as a teacher when you're in the classroom is that you can see very clearly which expressions are good to use in a more formal setting. And you'll see here in the In Conversation panel that in terms of, while we do use it in conversation, you'll see how much more frequently it is used in formal speaking. The same as with as far as whatever a topic is concerned. We do use it in conversation, but it's used very frequently in formal speaking. So while we want students to be using appropriate spoken language, we also need our students to be using appropriate language when they are writing. Too often students use informal language in their writing, and it certainly puts them at a disadvantage uh, when they're taking tests, when they're writing papers, or indeed in any work situation where they may be required to be using their written English skills. And um, even the use of informal language in email uh, can be very off-putting. Um, each year here in Park City, we're in a ski resort. Um, we host a number of students from Brazil and Argentina and Chile 
and they come up here from uh, these countries for um, their summer vacation to work in the ski resorts during the winter season. And we receive lots of emails from these students. We meet them while they're here in Park City. And it's very interesting. Um, a lot of the email we receive, the students are using very informal language uh, in the email. And when you're reading it, it, it doesn't seem quite right. It, it's a little jarring. So even in email, we might expect students to use more appropriate uh, written expressions and written language. We don't really expect to see students writing things like, I'm going to be there on Tuesday. So this is certainly something we need to focus on with higher level students. And again, this ability to research the difference between spoken and written language and apply this to the um, teaching materials that we create is very valuable. And it's this kind of research that you can take directly into your classroom and that can have a real impact on your students' ability to perform at higher levels. And certainly there may be some evidence uh, that students who do use appropriate written language uh, in their tests will be marked up for that and may well perform better in their test scores. So it's certainly um, a very um, important skill to be able to distinguish between written and spoken language. And really, we do recommend that when you're choosing materials to use in the classroom uh, with your higher level students, um, that you choose materials that can guide you through these kinds of differences in spoken and written language. And you'll see here an extract from a writing lesson um, where we use um, what we call writing versus conversation panels um, to exemplify these kinds of differences. So in this example, um, we're teaching how to express results in writing. So this is a little grammar panel uh, for a writing activity. And we are saying you can express a result in writing with present participle clauses, and you can also use as a result consequently or therefore. So we're teaching some specific expressions here to express results in writing. And you'll see in the panel, again, based on the research from the Cambridge International Corpus, that we're able to tell you how frequently um, those expressions are used, first of all, in conversation, and then secondly, in academic writing. And you'll see here, as a result, this expression is used in conversation, but it's well used in academic writing. Ditto with therefore. Except with therefore, you can see that it is very frequently used in academic writing. And again, consequently, it's used in conversation. It's a great expression for academic writing. Here's one final example. In the writing versus conversation chart, we can show you how frequently the expression may well is used in formal writing and speaking. Again, you see it's used in conversation. Look how frequently may well is used in formal speaking. And again, how frequently may well is used in academic writing. So there are ways uh, and materials that you can access to help you make um, and distinguish between um, Wrote, uh, spoken language and written language. Um, a fourth question that occurred again and again in the um, survey that we uh, that Cambridge did earlier in the year was a question that centered around teacher language use. And teachers 
um, asks this kind of uh, question, a variation on this question. How can I improve my own language skills? Um, teachers sometimes felt that they were not confident about their own language use in the classroom, especially um, at higher levels and teaching higher level students. Well, perhaps the most say here is that we are all still language learners. Even for Jeanne and I, in our native tongue, we are still learning English. We're still learning new expressions. We're still learning uh, new words in our own language. We often come across a word that is new to us or a word for which we can't quite articulate the meaning. So it's really important, I think, to allow ourselves to learn and to let our students see that we are still language learners also. There's no reason that if we as teachers come across a new word in a text, or indeed if one of our students uses a new word, um, we should be doing what any good student would uh, do and what we would want our students to do and simply ask what it means. Or we can look it up in a dictionary and we can certainly say to our students, well, there's a new word for me, you learn a little every day. And really commend the student and say, you know, it's great that I learned something new from you. It's really a great face saver for the teacher and it really boosts the student's confidence too. With regard to grammar, um, if you're not clear on a, a particular grammar point, then it really helps uh, to have chosen good sound teaching material. Uh, materials that have a thorough and robust teaching notes that can really explain um, these difficult language points and walk you through them. Teaching grammar at higher levels is a really a tricky business, as, as Jeanne alluded to. And so for us as textbook writers, um, the teaching notes to us are really just as critical as preparing good student uh, book content. So at higher levels especially, it becomes really important to ensure you have good supportive teaching notes. And we recognize that teachers may need some support. Um, teaching at higher levels is not for the faint-hearted. And as this comment shows uh, from a teacher, teaching guides can be really very useful and supportive. Um, let's take a look at this. It, this was a comment about a uh, Touchstone Teachers Edition, and this was the teacher's comment. As a new teacher some 16 years ago, I had to rely a lot on teacher's books for teaching guidance and lesson plans. If you have been around for as long as I have, you will have learned the hard way that teacher's books are not always what they're cracked up to be. More often than not, instead of a book that guides teachers, they're a mere key to the student book activities with the occasional photocopyable material. What I've discovered in Touchstone was that I can completely rely on the teacher's book to get clear, thorough, concise step-by-step -step journey into language exploration with my students and a wealth of ideas and opportunities for stimulating discussion. It is not, however, a teacher breathes in, teacher breathes out approach to lesson planning and allows for adaptation to fit your students' needs. And here is her advice. Don't reinvent the wheel. Embrace the teacher's book lesson plan. Let it guide you. If anything, it might change some of your established routines and your classroom dynamics. The inductive approach to teaching is apparent throughout and urge you to step out of your comfort zone and teach differently. We would certainly uh, encourage teachers to step out of their comfort zone with regard to their own language abilities. Be confident, um, and your students will see that and will certainly respond to that. And remind students that uh, you are on a language journey um, just as they are and just as we are 
as native speakers. Uh, one other thing you can do um, to help you be more confident about your own language abilities as you go into the classroom is perhaps pre-prepare some of your language and get into the habit of using more challenging language in class. And this kind of ties back into uh, what Jeanne was talking about earlier with regard to vocabulary. Get into the habit of using more challenging language in class. And instead, for example, of asking your students, what do you think? Ask them, what is your interpretation of this? What's your point of view on this issue? How do you feel about this particular matter? In fact, you can make this into a fun activity um, to challenge your students. Encourage students to reformulate things that you say. Get students to try and say something in a more formal way, or to rephrase the question that you ask, or to reformulate a comment that you make and challenge them to improve your language. It certainly becomes a good-natured way uh, to engage students in noticing language uh, and to actively improve it um, in a way that helps everybody learn and boosts not only the teacher confidence but also uh, student confidence. Um, Daniela Nicosia made a comment earlier that students use words they know to avoid people making fun of them. And I think that's a really valid comment. Um, but perhaps by um, explaining to students that you are also learning language and encouraging them to do these kinds of activities that take you and the students out of your comfort zone, uh, perhaps students will feel a little more confident um, to try uh, using words and using language um, that they are avoiding uh, using in the classroom. Um, Jeanne and I would like to thank you um, to listening to our responses to these four questions. We would now like to turn over to you um, to get your feedback, get your comments, um, ask your questions, and indeed if you have any ideas that you would like to share on any of these four topics, on vocabulary, grammar, um, on spoken versus written language, or indeed on um, establishing teacher confidence in the classroom with regard to uh, our own language skills, please uh, please do send in your comments on the um, chat board and we'd be happy to respond. Brilliant. Thank you very much, um, both Helen and Jan. We've got some questions in already. Um, the first one um, is from Rodolfo, Rodolfo sorry, Mattiello. Um, and I think, um, I think Jan's ready to answer this one. Um, Rodolfo says that um, he's taught so many students that refuse to make use of appropriate language um, because they claim that their superiors, often from English-speaking countries, claim that they, they don't require them to use um, formal language or appropriate language. So, um, Jan, I believe you wanted to answer that one. Yes. Yeah. I, I thought that was a very interesting um, comment, Rodolfo, and um, while I'm not doubting what your students are telling you, um, one thing I would like to share with you, which is perhaps something you can pass on to your students. Um, remember earlier on I said that there's a big research project called English Profile going on at the University of Cambridge. And um, as well as the research on the IELTS exam that I talked about, there was actually some research done on writing scripts. And this research was done by a computer not a human being. Now, a computer has no human prejudices whatsoever. And it compared the linguistic features of low-scoring scripts with high-scoring scripts. And it identified a number of positive discrimination factors, i.e. items which occurred in the high-scoring students' language which didn't occur 
in the low scoring students language. Now these are things which the um, the human reader probably isn't as aware of as the, com the computer. So a lot of this is, I think is subliminal. Um, and one of the things that they discovered um, relates back to one of the slides Helen showed about modals being, modal verbs being used with adverbs like may well and could certainly. And it was discovered that um, students who consistently use that structure, that that structure was a positive discriminator. It, it awarded students extra marks. Now I don't think the examiners who read these sat down and thought, oh, I'm going to give an extra mark to somebody who uses a modal verb and an adverb. But obviously there is a subliminal effect there that a student who uses structure, that structure and others which they identified, um, it created a, a positive impression with the examiner and therefore the student got a higher mark. So I think al although people may say, oh, we don't want you to use fancy language, I think there is a subliminal um, effect there. And okay. Jan, could I, could I also add, I think, I think what may be useful in the classroom is to set up activities that distinguish between informal speaking situations and more formal speaking situations. Um, likewise with writing where you're typically using more formal language. But I think in higher, higher level learning materials, it's important to distinguish between informal conversations and also um, to set up activities where students can use more formal language. So for example, we showed examples of, of students discussing topics in a formal seminar setting where you would expect students to use more formal language. Um, and I think that can be helpful for students to, to really clearly delineate where we expect you to use different kinds of language um, in the classroom. Okay, thanks. We've also got a question now from um, Tatiana Lukashova who asks, um, how can I help my students with phrasal verbs? I saw that and I, I smiled because I, um, one of the things I tried to do in my younger days was to learn Russian and um, I found all the um, um, prepositions and particles and, and so on very difficult in Russian too. So uh, it, phrasal verbs are a nightmare. Um, for learners because you take these key verbs like have and take and get and go and you add these little particles like out and up and down and round and you create all kinds of meanings that you can't um, see from the sum of the individual parts. I think as with learning anything, the key to learning phrasal verbs is to provide ways that students can say something with that language which, which is true for them and which means something to them. So if you take a phrasal verb like um, I know, give up, as in to stop doing, for example. You need to make sure that everyone in the class can say something about something they'd like to give up, they have given up, they would never give up doing. You need to find ways that the students can say something which is true and personal and meaningful for them. Either create a situation, um, students write a little uh, conversation or, or write something that they would say about themselves using that language which is true and, and share it with others and exchanging this kind of uh, information would, is a way of helping to reinforce it. Thanks. Um, Helen, do, Helen I... do you want to add anything, I Helen? Yeah, I did. I, I thought um, I thought also with, with phrasal verbs, I think it's extremely important 
again, to choose materials um, that present phrasal verbs very clearly and give very clear and varied context um, with the phrasal verbs being used in a variety of contexts. Um, because as Jeanne said, you, it's really hard to, to determine what a phrasal verb means. So you need to see it used in a variety of contexts to really grasp its meaning. So for example, Jeanne, Jeanne used the, um, the phrasal verb give up. You need to see that used in you know, give up a bad habit or to give up a secret. Um, and it's really very useful to have materials that, that give that variety of context so that students can see really clearly how these phrasal verbs are being used. And then, of course, you can apply a variety of follow-up activities and, and different ways that Jeanne has just talked about for students to remember uh, those, those particular phrasal verbs. Okay, great, thanks. We also, um, I should mention that um, Cambridge also produces um, an app for both um, iPhones, iPads, and um, Android called the Phrasal Verb Machine. And I'm just putting a, a link to that in the, in the chat box. That's quite a, a fun little app that um, learners can use. So that's um, the uh, Phrasal Verbs Machine. Okay, I've got another question now um, from, actually following on nicely from me just talking about an app there, um, from Katy Faduli, who says, in a world dominated by gadgets of all kinds that use apps for communication between teens, how can teachers better motivate students to use written formal language? Because they're, they're quite doubtful about the value of that. Mm. Yes, there are a few comments here about um, whether students actually need to write. And mm. I suspect um, part of this, this comment is in, in a lot of the international exams, students are asked to, to write things which they might not ever need to write in their in their own language, and I, I think that's that's an issue. But if students are not taking these examinations, it's perhaps worth opening the discussion with your students as to what it is that they are learning English for. Why are they learning English um, at a high level? Now, it could well be that they just want to chat, and if they do, that's that's fine. In which case, perhaps you don't need to teach them how to write. But I think in this day and age, even though we're not writing letters as often as um, some of the examinations perhaps might make us believe, we are all writing more to people using emails and texts and so on. And it's not just the type of writing that is important, whether it's an email or a letter or an essay, what is important is the relationship that you have with that person. As Helen was talking about earlier with the email, um, it's not appropriate to use uh, gunner forms to people that you don't know very well or with whom you have um, a more formal relationship. So I think it's worth opening the discussion with students as to when are they going to use English in what context and who with, because I think that will guide what you what you teach them and why you're, you're te teaching them. I, I would concur, Jan, absolutely. And certainly with regard to email, um, there seems to be some sort of shift in um, students and, and generally people thinking that they can write an email in spoken form so that they're speaking to you. Um, but it just comes across as being very inappropriate and, and not being quite right. And, um, and you know, students may not think that they need to write. Clearly, students are writing in English for, for maybe different reasons, as Jan explained. Uh, maybe they're not doing exams, but they are writing to email to native speakers overseas when they're traveling, when they're looking for uh, summer work uh, opportunities, for example. And, the, and their writing does need to be appropriate. So as Jen said, I think if you can set up opportunities to talk to students about these situations and explain to them that, you know, writing does need a different level of formality. Um, it's not just something with, with uh, language learners of, of the second language of English. I have a teenager um, and we experience this same difficulty with native speakers. Uh, 
teenagers are on these um, devices the whole time. We're even trying to find ways to cut down spending as much time on the devices. And their written English skills are a challenge, even for native speakers. So it's something we need to be aware of and something we do need to address as well. Yeah, thanks. Got a good comment from Luciana in the in the chat, who also points out that that students might not be that interested in, in writing right now, but it's, it may be something they they will actually need in the future. But um, we've got a, a couple of questions now relating to um, viewpoint and touchstone. Um, so Suresh um, asks whether um, these books, uh, with the viewpoint books, are also apply or would be useful for IB students. Uh, international, oh, what, sorry. Uh, international baccalaureate students. Okay, that's. And, and what kind of are these students at the level of? Um, they're, yeah, they're sort of B two C one level of the Common European Framework in reference. I would say that they would be absolutely excellent for that um, kind kind of level. Viewpoint one is pitched at a good B2 level um, going into C1, and viewpoint two is, a, is C1 level going into C2. So all levels are a, a, a climb. So viewpoint two would, um, some, Adriana has just said that the International Baccalaureate is between C1 and C2, then viewpoint two would be a, a good, good fit for you. There. There. Um, can we just go back? There was a, there was a there was a, a comment which I I felt um, a very heartfelt comment meant coming to me earlier about um, about writing and how to teach writing because students feel lost and and um, I think was it Sanjita yes, said Sanjita. so that and she um, Sanjita feels lost too as I often do when I when I have to write I think. The best thing to do is to find materials that give you ideas of the co for the content and give you ideas for how to phrase that content and give you ideas for how to organize that content. So there are three levels. There are ideas, there's the language to express those ideas, and the organizational, um, the organization of those ideas. and Look for materials which help you with all three. Okay, thanks. Um, oh, sorry, Jean, I... sorry, please. Uh, Helen, sorry, please. I, I just want to add to that too, Jean, because I, I noticed that same comment. And I think also it's really important to make it really clear for students that there's a reason uh, for, for doing whatever piece of writing they're doing. They're not simply producing a piece of writing that maybe the teacher is going to read, or maybe at best the, the peer or partner is going to read, and then that's the end of it. I think if we can find ways to really motivate students um, and say to them, your, your writing is either going to be displayed, you're going to write a letter that is actually going to be sent to somebody, or you're going to write a, a piece that we're going to try and send to a local newspaper and see if we can get it published, or maybe it's something that's going to be published in the university magazine, or maybe we can enter it into some kind of competition. And of course, you can go online and find all kinds of uh, competitions that are free to enter, you know, in magazines and newspapers and on, uh, online competitions, et cetera. So that students really feel motivated that they're producing a piece of written work that may have some kind of outcome or some kind of result. I think that's really important too. Thanks. Do you think um, blogging would, um, would serve that purpose as well? Absolutely. Great okay. idea. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I think we've got time for maybe one one more question. Um, let's uh, try to find someone that hasn't been asked for. A question from um, Daniela Nicosia, who asks, how can we help students when we're really not sure about the appropriateness of our own vocabulary? I think that's that's a very good, good question. And um, I think, as Helen alluded to earlier, we are all learners of vocabulary there are when i read ielts um tests for example i sometimes have to look up words to find out what they they mean as helen said we are all learners so 
I think we often feel that because we're the teacher, we have to know everything. We have to be the fount of all knowledge. And it really isn't, isn't the case. So I think perhaps an open and honest dialogue with students that really no one knows every, everything. No one knows every word. Don't worry about it. Set out on the journey to find the meanings of words together and share the fact that we are all learners, including the teacher. Absolutely, and I think if you have uh, particularly strong students in your classroom, um, one thing you can do, and which is quite um, a fun thing to do, in fact, is actually sometimes have those students take the role of the teacher and have them prepare um, a language point or prepare a vocabulary presentation and have them actually take your role as the teacher and um, you know, share with them that you're on a journey together, you're on a language learning journey together. And, you know, you're on the same team and there's, there's no need for you as a teacher to lose faith because you don't know some of the expressions um, that, that, you know, maybe your students do. And also, as, as we mentioned earlier, one of the things you can do as a teacher is pre-prepare some of your language in class, uh, for class. So get into the habit of asking questions in different ways instead of saying what does this mean um, ask what is the meaning of this particular expression or for example um, and, um, and and just explain to your students you're on the same path and you're on the same journey and you're in the same boat like, just like Adriana does <laughs> absolutely Excellent. I think that's a very good um, very good note to end on that yeah, we are all yeah, we are all learning English still, um, however, however long we've been speaking it and learning it. I'm afraid that's all we've got um, time for today. But um, I'd just like to say before we finish, I'd like to thank Helen and, and Jan for, for being excellent presenters. And also to say that um, if you've enjoyed today's webinar, we've got another one coming up on Thursday when Chris Redston, who's one of our authors for Face to Face, will be talking about helping students with vocabulary. And you can sign up for that on our news and events page, which Simon is just posting into the chat box right now. So just to finish off with that, thanks very much, Helen and Jan. And thanks to everyone who contributed, who asked questions. Don't forget that we've recorded today's session, and it will be available on our catch-up page. Um, we'll post the link for that as well. Um, on our catch-up page very soon. And if you'd like a certificate of attendance for today's webinar, then um, please email Kerry Start. We'll put the link for that also into the chat. So thanks, Helen. Thanks, Shan. And um, have a good rest of the day, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you.